watching Tag TV. So after those beautiful notes of music, we are, we are here to, uh, to discuss education. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with uh, um, a mantra from the Vedas. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karvavahi Tejas Vena Vadhita Mastu Ma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 So um, may we move together as we just did. May we, may we relish our learning together. May we perform our studies with vigor and deep concentration. May our studies be filled with brilliance of understanding leading to knowledge. May it not give rise to dvesha. So may, may we learn with, uh, without any hostility. Um, may there be peace within, peace here, and peace throughout the universe. A, a society's ability to prosper and grow depends on the, um, the people's edification. A good education system Constructively, constructively molds the minds of the next generation. Its absence can cause a nation to stagnate, its people to become ignorant, and its ideas to get frozen in time. So here we have a, a very accomplished panel, and I'll, uh, I'll introduce them uh, shortly to you. We, um, we have Parth. Parth is a student at Princeton University with a bachelor's in mathematics, and he's now doing his PhD in economics. He's currently serving as the national president of the Hindu Students Council. And uh, he, is, uh, he was one of the coordinators for the Hindu Youth Conference at the World Hindu Congress in 2018. Uh, he is also a prolific writer. Uh, you may have read him in the Huffington Post. Uh, also, um, he writes on Bharat and Hindu Dharma in Swarajya. Professor Parul Kumar. Uh, she's an educator at Le Lexington School District with a PhD in uh, medicinal chemistry. She's also taught at uh, Suffolk University um, organic chemistry. Um, she was also trained as a researcher, and she's passionate about teaching young minds uh, to observe, explore, and question through science. She believes that children are natural-born scientists, so may all uh, our... our um, our, our science feelings come out today. Uh, Professor Prasad Jayanti, um, he went to Ramakrishna Mission School in Chennai for his um, school education. And then after uh, getting his degrees from IIT Madras in mechanical engineering, and then uh, he went over to computer science, where he's been uh, working on concurrent algorithms, and he's a professor at uh, Dartmouth College. He's been awarded the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship, and he's been um, awarded twice the Distinguished Teaching Award, once at Cornell University during his uh, uh, studies, and then at Dartmouth College. He's been the chair of computer science department before, and he's again serving as the chair. And he uh, has been presented the Elizabeth Howland Hand Otis Norton Pierce Award for being an outstanding teacher of the undergraduates. Uh, next, we have Professor Anil Segal, who is a professor of mechanical engineering at Tufts School of Engineering. Um, he uh, comes from, uh, from IIT Mumbai and then from Georgia Tech. He's been at Tufts since uh, early 80s. He's also been the department chair and director of international programs for the School of Engineering at Tufts. He's a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. And, he's been, uh, and he has received the Distinguished Service Alumni Award from IIT Bombay. He's been the Erskine Fellow uh, at University of Canterbury. And he's had many distinguished appointments, including visiting scientists at uh, MIT, summer faculty fellow at Argon National Labs, NASA Lewis Research Center, Oak Ridge National Labs, etc. cetera. Um, uh, last but not the least, we have Professor Mahesh Sharma, who's the founder for Center for Teaching and Learning of Mathematics, um, and also um, Berkshire Mathematics in England. He is a former president and professor of mathematics education at Cambridge College, where he taught mathematics and math education for more than 35 years to undergraduate and graduate students. He's internationally known for his work in mathematics learning problems and education particularly dyscalculia and other specific learning disabilities in mathematics. 
Uh, he has trained not just students, but also teachers. And he's been the chief editor and publisher of Focus on Learning Problems in Mathematics. Uh, he writes a blog on mathematics teaching and learning. So we have a very distinguished panel here. And um, I'll, I'll give you a little introduction to myself. And then I would like each of the panelists to have about five minutes each to introduce themselves. And we have a number of um, questions that we'd like to ask them. But if you would like to ask them questions, please write them down and, uh, and, and pass them to us so that I, I may include them in our discussion. We'd like this, once we've introduced ourselves, we'd like the session to be as interactive as possible. So um, I started out in, uh, um, in Kendri Vidyala in Central School in India, as it's called. So you, you heard a bit of that this morning. Um, Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya. Again, let us lead from uh, darkness to light. So all, all the Kendri Vidya layouts here, I, I see Ranjini ji nodding her head, know how we started the mornings uh, in Kendri Vidya and then went on to IIT Kanpur, and then uh, where I learned a bunch of fluid mechanics, which I now use for ocean circulation. Uh, last six or seven years, I've been leading a program between US and India on uh, studying the monsoons. So that has about eight or 10 universities uh, from the US associated with it. So Woods Hole MIT is part of it. Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego is part of it. Uh, of course, my university, UMass Dartmouth, and uh, many other universities around the US, along with the national labs. There are also eight or 10 um, universities in India. So the IITs and the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, along with Ministry of Earth Sciences uh, institutions in India, IIT in Pune, which does uh, climate modeling for India, as well as uh, Indian Meteorological Department and National Institute of Ocean Technology are all our collaborators. So this, this work has been going on where we've been studying um, how the ocean and the atmosphere talk to each other, uh, and particularly in the Bay of Bengal for the last six years. Uh, and we've done that by taking global research vessels. These are large research vessels from the US to Chennai, and then done our field work there, as well as contributions from India in form of their research vessels, Sagar Nidhi. So uh, I've been using my, my mechanical engineering training uh, to study the Indian monsoons, along with many Indian scientists. And we've been training the next generation of scientists, both from the US and, and them getting a background in tropical uh, oceanography and monsoons, as well as uh, trying to improve the monsoon predictions um, for India and, of course, the rest of the world. So I'll now move on and uh, hand over to Parth so he can introduce himself. Thanks, Amaji, and thank you to everybody involved in organizing Threads 2019. Um, it's been a wonderful experience, and thank you for having me on the panel. So. As Ahmed Ji mentioned, I'm currently studying economics at Princeton. Um, specifically, I study political economy, which is the study of how the structure and the incentive structures within the political system affect policy and affect economic outcomes. Um, but as Ahmed Ji also said, when I was an undergraduate, I studied mathematics. Um, and I loved studying mathematics. I loved the idea of um, my career and my passion really about solving problems. But I knew from a very young age that what I really wanted to do was learn about how the world works. Um, I was lucky enough to be in a public school where uh, my teachers instilled uh, a really great value um, to me about uh, education and about learning. Um, and I was specifically really interested in geography because of that reason of figuring out how the world works, how different societies interact with, with one another. So going from mathematics to political economy is a little bit of a jump. And I think the seed of, of that was really sowed in 2011 through Indian politics. So in 2011, it was the year that I was going into Princeton from high school. And that was also the year that the Anna Hazare movement took off in India. Uh, and it took off in that summer, actually. Um, so during the summer, when I had nothing to do between high school and college, all I'm doing is I'm watching Arnab Goswami yell at the Congress party day in and day out. So that had a really formative experience on me. And I started asking questions about what was happening in India and what was happening uh, more broadly. So for example, um, you know, what are the strategies that the parties are using and the strategies that the Anna movement is using to help them gain leverage in this situation? 
Um, and how are they able to mobilize this mass of people behind them? What is it that's making them successful? And how are people making the choice to join this movement, uh, which is a costly choice to give up your job, to give up um, you know, your profession, to go and join this movement? So those were the, ty the types of questions that I started asking. Um, and those are still the types of questions that I ask today. Um, but if we go even further back, uh, further back from 2011, um, to my days in a VHP Balvihar, for example, um, where we were taught the itihasas from a very, very young age. Um, the Mahabharat and the Ramayan played a really important role for me while I was growing up. Um, and there's too many examples to cite about how these texts teach us and, and ask the same questions about politics. But one important example that um, does come to mind, specifically related to the project that I'm working on right now, which has to do with bargaining, is the example of Duryodhan rejecting the offer of um, five villages made to him by Yudhishthir. If you give us five villages for our new kingdom, we'll leave you alone. And he says no. Um, in classical economic theory, it said that you should always be able to come to some agreement uh, right away when you bargain. It's a classic result. Um, but what economists have been looking at more recently is why this fails. And one of the, the, the most recent uh, explanations for this is that when people are overconfident, um, that's really what causes a friction in bargaining what, and is what causes delay to come to an agreement. So this is a very early example from our itihasas of exactly this result, um, which was found just five years ago. Going even further back and, and looking at some of the other texts, we can see that our own tradition, the Hindu tradition, has a really long um, and rich uh, tradition of looking at uh, political science and, and political economy. The Arthashastra, for example, has been mentioned before, but one of the things that people often don't mention is that in his text, Cortelia mentions other political philosophers that he's responding to, and he specifically is looking at the arguments they're making and responding in good faith. That idea of having humility um, when we talk about our own points of view, when we talk about our own research, is something that emanates uh, really well from the Hindu tradition. The Hindu tradition is about having a really open mind and being able to take in and absorb the perspectives of other people and respond from our own. That process of purva paksha is something that's really important and something really unique um, that the Hindu education system can provide to us, which is relevant still today. Um, and I want to say that a lot of the Hindu American professors that I have come into contact with um, have embodied this sense of, of humility. So whether it's um, Professor Bhargav um, at the Princeton uh, University Department of Math, which, which I was part of, um, or if it's uh, Professor Kak, um, who's, who's here in the audience, or if it's um, uh, Prasad Garu, who, have, who I've gotten to know through his, his uh, son and daughter, um, all of these people have been very inspiring just in the way they present themselves within academia, um, which can be a very cutthroat and a very egotistical environment. Um, but I've, from what I've seen, the Hindu American um, representatives of our community within that space present themselves in a very humble and very endearing way. One of the other things that I did want to also mention, which was very important to me personally in making the choice to go into academia and to go into the space of, of education, was that there's very few Hindu American scholars within the social sciences specifically. So if we think about economics, politics, anthropology, all of those areas, public policy, have very few representatives from our community, people who would openly and proudly identify themselves as being Hindu, um, which is, of course, not the case with other religious communities, uh, Muslims, Jews, Christians, what have you. Um, so who is it actually that's studying Indian politics and studying the way that Hindu society works? Um, who is it that's commenting, for example, uh, most recently about Article 370? Um, who is it that's talking about India as a, as a sociological future entity and what its direction is going to take? It's not us. It's never us. So this was something that was something that was really important to me, given that I already had an interest in this area, um, was to look out and see there's nobody who's speaking for our community. Um, putting my hat on as uh, the leader of Hindu Students Council and thinking about um, programming on our campuses, for example, if we wanted to invite somebody um, on this most recent issue relating to Kashmir, we looked around and we saw there's all of these professors who are being invited to talk from the Kashmiri Muslim side, from the Pakistani side, but there's really nobody who can speak from the Kashmiri Pandit side who's also a social scientist. So that's really what motivated me, given that this is a space where there really is very little representation from the Hindu American community 
to go out there and speak our truth. That's ultimately what education is about. It's about presenting your perspective and your truth um, to the world and presenting it in a way that's relatable and is understandable to other people so that they can learn from you. So that's really how I got interested and um, you know, involved in this process of joining academia. Um, and that's really my journey. And I hope to share more about that with you all today. Thank you, Parth, for that uh, yeah. you know, beautiful words of wisdom along with your own uh, experience there. Vidya Dadati Vinayam. You've, you've, you've truly captured that. Uh, Parulji is our next panelist. Okay. Thank you, Amitji. I am Namaste. I'm Parul Kumar. And uh, I'm a medicinal chemist by training, but I'm an educator at heart. So uh, I'm really excited to be here today. And thank you, Threads, for giving me this opportunity to talk about my views on education and share it with all of you. So. I just want to talk about three things which I'm really passionate about. And since I teach secondary education, I'm very passionate about teaching young minds, young children. So for any society, any civilization to progress and prosper, it depends on its people, how aware they are, how educated they are, and how they care about each other. Like Amitji said, the good education system, a very good education system, consistently looking for newer and better ways to enrich the minds of its youngs, the future generation. And if that education system is lagging, then that society becomes stagnant and their ideas get frozen in time. So lifelong, being a lifelong learner is very, very important for to success in life, for happiness eventually, and for any individual, a society, or a nation altogether. So Will Durand said it best. He said, education is the transmission of civilization. Mm -hmm. So education, obviously, we all agree that it's very important. The second thing I want to talk about, that diversity is our strength. We should learn from different systems. Different cultures have their own pedagogy. That is the art of educating. Like the Greek system, they focus on the, having the fundamentals very well. British system is known for its rigor. American system is known for its experiential learning, hands-on learning. In Finland, they instill the value of love of learning in children. Our Indian um, uh, Gurukul system was about the holistic development of the child. So I want to talk a little bit about our system, our Gurukul system. Gurukuls were these centers of education where children immerse themselves in the learning process. The teachers were expert in their fields, be it um, science, tech, um, art, music, sports, shastras, religion, physical development, anything. They, they were experts there, and they were small class sizes. There was a lot of student and uh, teacher interaction. Teachers care about their students. And these children, they will do all their chores by themselves. So they become self-reliant and eventually become valuable members of the society. They learn not only academics, but about art, culture, music, sports. And it was a holistic development of child. So that was very important. And we have to learn and we have to keep this mind. And we have to learn from our heritage. The third thing I want to talk about is the use of technology, because these days a lot of technological tools are available to us as educators and to students. And technology is great. Effectively used, technology is the great enabler. Technology, these tools are here to help us to get our work done or accomplish our task more effectively and efficiently. But having a untargeted and uh, use of technology or having those technology on our fingertips at all times creates an enormous challenge. You know, it's a big distraction. We all are on our phones all the time. So there is a, like, there are certain risks which come with that, having spreading the fake news, getting witted data, which sometimes curriculums use in their education, and they don't even check the validity of the data. So that's important to check what you hear. 
One thing which I am most concerned about and which I see in secondary school, that the critical thinking and problem solving skills, they are diminishing. Because these days, you have a question, you put it in the search engine, or you have the answer. So that skill of reading from five different books, talking to other people, try looking at the data, analyzing the data, and extrapolating the information out of it, that skill is going away. And which is very important, not only just to get through the school and college, but in life. You will always have problems. You will always have challenges which you have to face and problem solve. So still, a lot of focus, a lot of concentration, a lot of diligence is needed to instill those values and learn those skills. Those are very, very important. So we should not leave that. We should definitely make an effective use of technology, but the basic skills of learning, we should still cultivate them. And I think the uh, progress or uh, success in career or in college starts at secondary school level. So I love, I enjoy teaching young minds and because that's our future generation. So one last thing I want to say that parents, it's very important. Parents are very important in the child's education. They are their first gurus. Home is the first gurukul where it all starts. So parents should definitely encourage their children to explore various things and then choose the, whatever they are passionate about and help and support them to excel in whatever they want. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pairalji. Um, uh, some beautiful lessons there, um, especially for technology. I think that, that that point really hit home to me because I see that in my students all the time. Um, moving on, Prasadji, could you uh, please? Can we share screen? Thank you. Um, can we expand? You can stand. Oh, yeah. sure. I'll, I feel usually much more energized <laughs> stand in front of you. <laughs> Namaste, everyone. Um, I can't tell you how happy I am uh, to be uh, with you, share my thoughts on education. If it were not for uh, Abhaya Asthana Ji, I wouldn't have even known about threats, and I wouldn't be here. Uh, so I miss him uh, here today. And uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, Abhay Ji, Jay Bansal Ji, and Sanjay Kaul Ji. So the panel is on education. So the first question is, what is education? So uh, let me share my understanding and my definition of what education is. And for this, I want to begin with Sanatana Dharma, which after all is the thread that unites us all and has made us all come here, right? So Sanatana Dharma, um, it should be very dear not just to us, but to the entire humanity, because it asserts that everyone, everyone can attain the highest state of moksha. And it doesn't stop there. It gives actual real guidance on how to get there. Right? What, is, what can be more wholesome than reaching the state of moksha the state of Brahmananda, isn't everything that we do in life in pursuit of happiness? <laughs> and so if, uh, if there is guidance on how we can launch ourselves to the highest state of moksha, Brahmananda, what more can beat it? Well, our rishis, in their highest states of consciousness, were able to lucidly see the truths of the universe, and they laid down laid down what our pursuits should be in our life. And those that they laid down are dharma, artha, kama, and moksha, which collectively are called purusharthas. So artha is the pursuit of wealth, and kama is the fulfillment of desires. But they were very careful to preface those two with dharma. <laughs> so uh, be dharmic as you pursue wealth and as you pursue 
uh, fulfillment of your desires. And the ultimate pursuit goal is, of course, moksha, liberation, brahmanandam. So if, um, well, I mean, should we accept what they said on faith? Well, um, I can say, uh, not that I have pursued these four um, um, uh, to their depth, but you know, I mean, have I pursued mathematics? Yes, I have. But isn't it, isn't it too presumptuous to say that I pursued mathematics? Mathematics is an ocean. What do I mean when I say I pursued mathematics? Well, I sampled a little bit of it. And I, have I pursued basketball? Yes, of course. But I mean, basketball has giants like Michael Jordan. Who am I to pursue basketball? I can't even jump in today. I can't even walk. By the way, my foot was in serious pain, uh, putting in question whether I could uh, get here. I'm so glad I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, so when we say, um, so we have inklings of truth from our little pursuits, from our little excursions. And uh, so from those little inklings, um, um, I'm convinced myself that purushadhas that our rishis have laid down as um, what our pursuit, uh, pursuits should be in life uh, are indeed so valid. And so if those should be our pursuits, <coughs> then what should education be? Education should help you pursue those <laughs> purusharthas, dharma, artha, kama, and moksha, right? So that to me is the definition of education. Education is that which helps us pursue purusharthas. Okay, so having, having shared with you my understanding of what education is, let me say a little bit about myself, where I'm coming from. Um, I received my education uh, first in India and then here in the United States. And from my education in India, which of course started from home, from my mother, from my father, from my grandmother, um, 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 and uh, from the society, from the middle class society that um, um, we were a part of, and from my very dear Ramakrishna Mission School. Um, um, I learned uh, a lot of things that were very touching and moving to the heart, and uh, that gave a lot of emotional fulfillment, even as we as family were struggling economically. But economical struggle is just, I mean, Bhavasagaram, you are swimming. <laughs> but, uh, but there was a lot of fulfillment from the values that I got from all of these various avenues. And then I came to the US. I studied at University of Delaware, where I got a couple of masters in mechanical engineering. And then I felt interested in computer science and moved there. And then at Cornell, which is where I got my PhD in computer science. And these places were terrific places to be in. I had a very fulfilling education. Um, I, I, I got to see the beauty of science. Um, and um, from there, I went to Dartmouth, uh, which is where I have been for the past 26 years. And um, you know, it's a joy to, when you, when you love something, when you see uh, some beauty somewhere, uh, what more can be, uh, what can be more joyful than the opportunity to share it with other curious minds? Uh, so, so it's an absolute joy. Uh, to be sharing whatever little I know about computer science or anything else with my students, mentoring students, doing research with them, it has been an absolute joy. So that's roughly what my background and upbringing um, uh, so far has been. Okay, so education is my passion. And um, uh, at this stage in my life, um, um, I decided that um, I would want to very much give back whatever little I can to the, uh, to the country, Bharat, that I drew so much from. Um, but what should, how should this passion translate into action? For this, I want to share with you three observations I made on the ground, three specific observations I made on the ground. Um, 
which were startling to me. The first observation. Um, so for the 35 years that I have been in the US, um, I have been traveling to India at least once initially, at least twice later on, and lately, I mean, at least thrice or four times each year. And in all these travels, um, um, I was um, uh, very, very interested in uh, uh, observing what the ground realities are. And let me tell you, starting 1997, so for the past 22 years, in all my travels in Andhra Pradesh, which is where mostly my travels uh, have been when, whenever I went to India, um, there have been uh, conversion out of Sanatana Dharma into Christianity has been going on at a rate that you just cannot believe. I mean, I have seen it with my own eyes. Okay? And uh, so much so that I believe, this is just my estimate, because I just moved through the society making these observations and um, um, obsessively. Um, um, I would estimate about 25% of uh, the population in the state of Andhra Pradesh has been converted to Christianity in the past 22 years or so. And Andhra Pradesh is not an exception. Telangana, which is where I travel also a bit, uh, I have witnessed the same thing. And in other places, I haven't traveled directly, but I gather that it is not much different in Tamil Nadu and in Karnataka. That's my observation one. Uh, by the way, let me cap that observation with one statement. Uh, so when something um, uh, so, uh, so tsunami is happening to demographics, um, at least you should hear, ab hear about it in the prominent mainstream news, right? We all probably, I mean, people sitting here, since we are like-minded, you probably have known about this observation, but it does not appear in the mainstream uh, news because it's not considered very uh, gentlemanly to even mention this, mention this issue. And that's a very dire state to be in. Observation number two. <laughs> um, my interests are fully shared, and that's my good fortune, by my wife, Aparna Jayanti, who is sitting there, and by my children, Sucharita, who graduated uh, from Dartmouth uh, five years ago, worked here in Boston for five years at Amazon, and is back to my, my college, Dartmouth, and my department, Computer Science, having married a few months ago, and uh, coming back to pursue masters. <laughs> and, uh, and my son, uh, Siddhartha Jayanti, who is here, and uh, who went to Princeton and was uh, a couple of years, one or two years junior to Path, and, uh, and is now a PhD student at MIT. All four of us share all of the interests, I mean, um, that you will see um, in, my, in my sharing and discussion with you. And anyway, all four of us went to a small town called Bhimavaram. We spent five weeks, um, um, 24 hours, <laughs> uh, with uh, uh, 45 students, um, uh, roughly 50% female and 50% male from the surrounding villages. And uh, we spent time with them. Um, um, and uh, so we, uh, the day started uh, uh, with sunrise, and uh, the day ended with, uh, with us telling them stories from uh, uh, the Itihasas. Ramayana and Mahabharata and so on. The next year, this is just to see what the state of education is like at various levels. Uh, the next year, children were not able to accompany, but my wife and I, we went to the same uh, town. But this time, we, uh, um, we spent a month with uh, degree students, degree students in computer science. They were third year students in computer science, mind you. And uh, so we wanted to spend a month, do a workshop with them. There was so much demand that about 125 students wanted to be part of it, but we wanted it to be very interactive. So we could really afford to take only 25 students. So how do you filter 25 from 125? The 125 was already a filtered down number from about 300. The college did the filtering, but it was up to us to filter them down to 25. So. Uh, 
it's always heart wrenching to um, select only a few and leave out the rest. But you had to do. Uh, we had to do it, and so I came up with um, a small test in computer science, and uh, with uh, with two, you know, very 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 simple problems. Uh, you just had to write an algorithm for. Uh, finding out the maximum uh, number in an array of numbers, if you can relate to that. I mean, nothing could be simpler than that. And I even gave them an example of how to do a sum of the numbers, and then I'm asking for the max of the numbers. And when I shared that question with my son, he said, uh, 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 Nanagaru, are you, uh, are you crazy? I mean, <laughs> uh, everyone is going to answer this as a result of which, I mean, your test won't be a test of selection at all. You will have to take all the 90 st 125 students. I said, don't worry. I interacted with them for a couple of hours uh, yesterday. So I think this is at the right level. And I administered that test. And what do you think was the performance like? What do you think was the maximum mark scored? 20? 20 out of 100? OK. To cut the story short, I mean, to make it uh, short, because time is of essence, zero. Zero was the max, not because I was strict. There was nothing, there was no avenue for being strict. I mean, just tell me how to do the max of an array of numbers. I mean, what can you be strict about, strict about it in grading it? Everybody got a zero because no one knew that. And they were third year computer science students. That's observation number two. Okay. Observe, uh, by the way, I mean, my wife, and I also take my mother wherever I go, because I mean, when I'm in India, I want to spend time with her too, even as I'm uh, passionate about all of these things. Um, and they said, should we go back? <laughs> we didn't end up going back. Fortunately, I also had a, a little test of English and a little test of Telugu, just to see how they communicate. And I use that. Uh, as a means to sort of filter out the uh, uh, number down to 25. But so much I can say about the experience and the month we spent with, with them and so on, but that's, again, I mean, time won't permit some of the time. Observation three. Um, while we were in Bhimavaram, we wanted to really see, I mean, how are little kids being trained? I mean, how have we come to be this? Um, so we went to the first grade um, and interacted with first grade students. And um, so we were told that the medium of instruction is English. And, um, but we had an idea of what that meant. <laughs> but we just wanted to test it out. <laughs> so after becoming very pally with the kids, because you first have to do that before, I mean, you can ask them or uh, make them do anything. And, and after being very friendly, um, I, I want to think I'm good at that. Maybe I am. But my wife is infinitely better than me in getting friendly with, with kids very quickly. And after all that happened, and we, we all became very good friends, we, um, uh, uh, my wife and I gave them one instruction. <laughs> we said, um, girls and girls only, can you please rise and clap? There was stunning silence. They were all seated. They continued to be seated. <laughs> and then we said in Telugu, Adapillalu, Meeru Matran Lechi Nelubadi, Chapatla Kottandamma, which is the same thing as what the English said. Um, and girls got up, and they clapped. So this is to first graders who spent an entire year already, their upper kindergarten year, UKG year, entire year already in English medium, where the teacher was always speaking to them only in English, because that's English medium, you know? You, you can, I can only talk to you in English, and you can only talk back to me in English. You will be punished if you said anything to me in Telugu. So if, if the student along the way in the bus, I mean, saw a beautiful rose and wanted to say, teacher, teacher, I saw this great rose today, well, I mean, they would, uh, they would not know how to say that in English, obviously. They don't even understand when you say it, and they can't say it. So if they came and said, Nei roja sano, which is a Telugu equivalent, then they would say, Kanna, sit down. Didn't I tell you that you should only speak in English? 
That's it. You have shut that child down forever. So if the basic ingredient for education is expression. When I have a thought, I have to be able to express it. When I have a question, I should be able to ask it. If you have made me mom because I should only talk in English and I have no idea how to do that, then what do I do? These are the three observations I wanted to share with you. So that's the dire state of, look at the lofty goal of pursuing Purushardhas on the one hand, and look at where we are with respect to education. So how do we bridge this gap? You know, I mean, any one of us, or probably even collectively as a group, we can only do so much, and that is my passion. So I would like to work towards a system of education in whatever minimal way that would create, that would create a society where, I mean, we can be fluent in Sanskrit, we can be fluent in our mother tongue, we are masters of science and in, uh, mathematics and so on and technology which are beautiful, but alongside we are also experts on our own value systems, on our own itihasas. And uh, we should be able to get into Harvard's and Princeton's of the world, IITs and IISs of the world, but we should also be masters of our own spiritual knowledge, Upanishads, Gita, Itihasas, and so on. And we should be able to debate and discuss and be able to present our viewpoints. And um, so that's my passion. And I would love to share it with you in the remaining time of the conference during the breaks and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Prasadji, for the inklings of the truth and also for the three points that we could uh, discuss later on. Um, Anilji, please. Thank you. So first, I'd like to thank the Threads uh, organizers and Sanjayji for organizing this panel and inviting me to be part of it. So when I started teaching in 1983, I used to give classes once a week, uh, three hour lectures. About 10 years after that, they said the attention span for students, they can't do three hours, so please do at least two 75 minute lectures. So I started doing that. About 10 years ago, I was told that's way too long, so why don't you do three 50 minute lectures? So I started doing that. And in the last couple of years, I've been told the student span is about three minutes. So why don't you tell everything you want to tell in three minutes, and then let's do some exercises in class. So that's what I'll do. I'll put everything I need to tell in about three minutes. So first, as part of our uh, history, we strongly believe in family system, and I believe in family, not just the immediate family, because my path has been slightly different, and I look at this world as a family, and I'll tell you why. The reason for that is my father passed away when I was eight years old in 1965. My mother was not a graduate. My sister that time was engaged to be married. We delayed her marriage for a year and a half so she could take care of the family while my older brother could finish his engineering college. So that's the first sacrifice which came from a sister. In 67, my brother graduated and basically got a job and he brought me up throughout my, the rest of my life. So that was the second member of the family. I was sort of walking around doing my thing till ninth grade when a teacher took an interest, a, a teacher from Kerala who took interest and said, you are a good student and try to do your best. And that would be the third point. When I made it to IIT, obviously with no resources, somebody in this world had created a merit come means scholarship, which is what I got to be able to go through my five years at IIT. Somewhere after that, I had to come here, needed some money. 
some Parsi bhai called Jamshedji Tata. <laughs> <laughs> he basically had a scholarship for anybody, for any family member of anybody who had ever worked in the Tatas. My father used to work for Tisco, so somehow I made it through that, and that's how I landed here. Somewhere here in the US, somebody funded a fellowship for me to come here, which was a president's fellowship, which brought me here and to this country. And I would say rest is history. So family basically plays a huge role in where and what we achieve in life. And it is not immediate families there, but it is everybody else. So that's how I'm here. I'm not going to talk about mechanical engineering here. So basically, I have four points to uh, put uh, as I see uh, the education. So Parul mentioned about parents. One of the things you will see with every artist, and you have seen here last two, three days, everybody says, my first guru was my parents. Somehow today we have decided to outsource parenting. We are all looking, when we are uh, in this country, which school system do I buy this house? Because why don't you look at what can I do inside the house? Why don't you look at, instead of going, I'm not against going to games or playing sports, but if you can go take your kid for three and, two, three and a half hours of football a week, Again, please do that. If you took that half an hour a day and did with them whatever subject is your passion, whether it's maths, whether it's language, whether it's uh, uh, the uh, dharma, please do that. I think the, your, I would love to see down the road when uh, somebody introduced, they say, my mother, my father was my first guru. And I think we have, dis uh, over the years, decided to outsource that. So I strongly uh, think that, that is something uh, we should go back to. The other thing we keep thinking about and we keep talking, world would be a better place with education. Education, as everybody in Boston knows, it's getting to be about 75,000 a year. Yesterday, there was an article which said, in 2025, University of Chicago will be the first one to cross 100,000 a year. If we can spend 100,000 a year for our kid, please take the time and put the resources to educate at least one other kid. Somewhere here in India, somewhere, I can guarantee you world would be a much better place. The third thing I would like to just mention is Everybody thinks anybody can do teaching. No, it is not like anybody can do teaching. Teaching is a very humbling experience. The rewards are not today. You hear about your fruits 20 years from now and somebody says, this is the person which mentored me. Today I'm sitting and thinking back about my ninth grade teacher who basically changed my life for where I am. So it's a long-term thing. Teaching is not for everybody. It teaches you to be humble. It teaches you to work with others. And it makes you a better person. So teach in whatever capacity you can. Doesn't have to be a full-time teacher at an educational institution or whatever. And finally, I would say people often will do take this course or that course, whether it's yoga or whatever, and everybody says, you, you have to practice every day. That's when you go, become efficient in it and you don't forget. I would say the same thing in life. You have to go to, do good every day to actually be good in your life. You can't just say, be good. Thank you. Thank you, Anilji. Uh, truly starting from Vasudeva Kutumbakam and lessons for all of us. Uh, Mahesh ji, please. May I take the place there? Sure. But I won't be too long. <laughs> Five minutes. Yeah. Good morning. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of sharing some ideas with you. I came to United States in 1967 
So there is nobody of my age here, so I can uh, speak from that perspective. Oh, it's two years younger. <laughs> I come from a family of teachers. As a matter of fact, in my family, there have been only three professions ever uh, existed, teaching, Vedya, and poets. And sometimes they were present in one person, for example, my grandfather. So I had no other idea of doing anything else except teaching. So I became a teacher. I started my teaching career at Rajasthan University as a professor of mathematics, and then Birla Institute of Technology and Science, which had a collaboration with, a, uh, collaboration with the MIT and few other universities. And I came as a visiting faculty in 1967-68 academic year with uh, four years experience in teaching. One day I was sitting uh, in my office and one of my colleagues in the math department came to me and he said, do you know that Noam Chomsky has invited Skinner and Piaget to the campus? And I said, who's Noam Chomsky? Some of you might know his name, the greatest linguist. And Skinner, a great psychologist, and Piaget, who's known as the father of education psychology all over the world, has shaped American education to a great extent. I did not know their names. And he made me feel so small. As a matter of fact, he made me feel like my education was so incomplete. So to please him, I went to a conference where these three uh, were there. And in a conference like that, they do not really talk to the con audience. They talk to each other. They are like three bulls fighting with each other. <laughs> but the ideas they gave, very, very important. And I was here for a year only. So at the end of uh, June, I was going back to my university in India. I decided I'll write a letter to Piaget, who was in Geneva at that time, conducting his experiments on children and how children learn mathematics. I wrote the letter thinking that there's a 50% chance that I might get a, an answer. But he sent an answer and said that we are having an institute for one month for those mathematicians who are interested in children. I had no interest in children, but I said, yes, I'm interested, so I joined PSA. Second week, I called my chairman at MIT, mathematics department. It cost me $75 at that time. Today is free. And I said, could you get me a job at a teacher's training college or university in America? And he said, why do you want to go to teaching? The teacher's training colleges in America are the pits. They are the lowest in the university. They are cash cow, but their reputation is not very good. And if you go there, you will never have a chance to get back into mathematics ever, which was my passion at that time. But I said, I would uh, like to go into teaching. So I joined Framingham State University. It was a Framingham State College at that time when I came back. It's the oldest teacher's training college in America established in 1839, and Horace Mann, who's the father of education in America. So there I started a small school for children age four to eight. I have a strong belief if children are given good education between the age of four and eight, then after that it's just doing the same thing. And there I started my career as a teacher. In the last uh, so many years, this is my 56th year of teaching, I have been fortunate to visit about 75 countries and participate in curriculum building and teaching mathematics. In America, in most professional schools, there is a pedagogy called Socratic questioning. But Socratic questioning started actually in India, where all ideas must be questioned. As a matter of fact, learning Upanishads is to ask questions only. When you ask questions, questions instigate language. Language instigates models. Models instigate thinking. Thinking instigates understanding. Understanding produces competent performance. Competent performance is the basis of long-lasting self-esteem and there is no learning without the feeling of self-worth. So any education 
which focuses on these processes is worth pursuing, continuing, and will result where everybody becomes an inquirer. In Greek language, the word for a teacher <coughs> is myutic. Myutic means a person who helps deliver the birth. In India, everybody's born at home, so you know what I'm talking about. So Socrates used to say, the teacher is that person who helps deliver the birth. That means the ideas are already there in the child's mind. The role of a teacher is to really make it possible, facilitate it. Very early on, after doing my undergraduate years, I joined Ramakrishna Mission as a brahmachari. And there, the motto of Ramakrishna Mission is Atmano Mokshartha Jagat Hitayache. So the role of a teacher is really to realize the potential of oneself and in the process be prepared to do something good for the world we live in. In Vivek Chunamani, there is a passage, Durlavam Traime Tetu, Deva Nugraha Kankshaya, Manishwatvam Mumukshatvam Mahapurushasam Shraya. It is very easy. Three things are very difficult, though. The birth of a human being, the desire to know, and then the company of a great man. Only by the grace of God these are possible. So teacher, many times, is in that role, that man or woman who is going to motivate them. So that is my concept of education, and that has motivated me for all my life. Thank you. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Deva Maheshwara. Uh, I'm uh, reminded of uh, of that shlok from uh, from what we just heard from Maheshji. So I have a few questions, and I would encourage you to send your questions our way, um, so that we can also take questions from the audience. Uh, I'll start with the the, uh, the 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 panelists have all talked about their values and um, what the Hindi values have given to them in terms of what they think education is. So I'd like to um, ask the first question to all the panelists, and we'll keep it to about two minutes or less. Please give examples of your personal stories of struggle, evolution of thought process, and uh, what inspires you to be in the field of education? Uh, let's start with you, Pat. Sure. So I think there's a, there's a few different things. I think there's a few different areas um, that, that inspire me. Um, and a lot of them come from, from Hindu thought. So one of the things that um, we haven't mentioned, and maybe Paralji can expand on this um, a little bit, is that um, our tradition, the Hindu education tradition, and the Hindu system in general places shikshaks, gurus, educators at the top. Um, they're the most revered people traditionally within our societies. Um, and as Hindu Americans, as people who live in the United States, I think we should be deeply worried about the way in which educators are being undermined and are being treated today. Um, you see teachers going on strike in just about every single state um, because their salaries are being cut and because their benefits are being cut. Um, and I've personally seen, so there's a Hindu organization that does um, a program called Guru Vandana, where they bring public educators from the local community together um, and they honor them in the traditional way by doing basically a puja. Um, and I've personally seen the educators that go to these Guru Vandana programs break down um, and they say that, you know, I thought nobody cared about what we were doing. And here we are in a Hindu space and we can see the value that the Hindu system and the Hindu community has for education. The other thing that I've already mentioned uh, that I've talked about that does inspire me is, is just, you know, this idea that the Hindu community doesn't really have a space within academia where our traditions, our values, and our, our perspective about our ep epistemology, really, about how the world should work and how the world does work is not represented in any, in any sort of meaningful way. And that's really, really important because Hindu ideas have potential not just to reveal our past, but also to shape our future. And that's something that is very important as somebody who's growing up as a second generation Hindu American for me personally, because I'm also looking towards not just our history, but how we can shape the future of this country and the future of the global society that is to come. 
So I think those two, those two ideas, um, both the idea that the Hindu education system has so much um, value. Um, you know, Mahesh Ji mentioned the, the Upanishadic thought, that, that structure of question and answer that's also there in the Gita, of course. Um, and also this idea of just being a representative in a space, like they were discussing advocacy and politics yesterday, being a representative of your tradition in a space that doesn't have that representation currently. Both of those twin ideas inspire me. Thank you, Pat. Paralji? I mean, since childhood, I feel like my best times were spent in school. I really enjoyed <laughs> school. I was a curious child, so I think I always looked up to my teachers and time spent with friends and learning was uh, really interesting for me. So, and I was always interested in science, and I think that's one thing which I want to bring my, uh, want to give, give from my side. Uh, like Prasadji said, that the joy is that whatever you are excited about, you can spread and you, into others, you can teach others. So I'm really big advocate for STEM education and especially in female, which we still in such an advanced country, we see uh, diminishing uh, somehow the lower numbers of females in STEM field. So I really want to encourage them and uh, I just, uh, I always want love to work with children. So I actually, God, I have a dream job. I love what I, I am really, I'm doing what I love. So I enjoy teaching and um, that just inspires me to become a teacher and to impart knowledge. Thank you, Prasadji. Personal story, stories of struggle, evolution of thought process, <laughs> what inspires you? <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Two minutes is something uh, not in my control, but you remind me, mm. and I'll stop in the middle of we, the sentence. We, we, we have a timekeeper here. <laughs> yes. Um, struggle, you said, um, so I'll, 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 I'll just relate my struggle. <laughs> um, it's a funny story. Um, 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 I studied uh, in a Telugu medium school, in Ramakrishna school. The medium of instruction uh, that I underwent was Telugu. So from class one to class 11, I studied everything, all the subjects in Telugu. And uh, naturally, I mean, my English fluency was uh, not good. I was not confident about um, English at all. Um, and uh, so when I first came to the US, um, my flight was delayed by 24 hours and uh, Pan Am, which is out of business now. But anyway, I mean, we were given these coupons for eating food or drinking and so on. Uh, I never used, I mean, this juice machines. <laughs> I was very thirsty. Eating was out of the question because I was vegetarian and I was not sure how to find vegetarian food and so on. But drinking, at least I could have done. And I was very thirsty and I had these coupons in hand, but didn't know how to use the machine. But uh, I could have asked someone, but I was neither confident that I would be able to ask the question right, nor confident that I would be able to understand what they say. <laughs> so I just kept those coupons with me and, um, uh, <laughs> and went thirsty <laughs> uh, rather than go, to the, uh, uh, go and uh, have um, uh, juice or Coke or whatever it is. Um, but despite all this, um, um, uh, if I have a life back again, and I will, <laughs> I would want to study again in my mother tongue, and that would be Marathi if I if I if I'm born in Maharashtra and French if I was born if I would be if I'll be born in France and Telugu if I'm reborn in Andhra Pradesh or now Telangana, <laughs> but uh, but mother tongue and why? That would be a very exciting answer that I would reserve because I want to respect this time my two two minute limit. <laughs> Thank you, Prasadji. In my house, Ruchi says that if she asks me a question on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, she's afraid she'll get a 50-minute lecture. And if she asks it on Tuesday and Thursday, she's afraid that I'll go on for 75 minutes. So moving on to Analji. Yes, I already talked about my struggle. What uh, motivates me to be in the field of education and what got me there was uh, my advisor, my PhD advisor, when I was doing my second year of master's had the trust that I could teach and actually asked me if I would not just give a lecture but be an instructor for a course. 
Uh, and that basically changed the life. Till then I was thinking maybe I should go to industry, but once I taught and saw the joys of teaching, so uh, that was one thing. And the other thing which kept me uh, in uh, teaching was um, I did one uh, summer in, uh, at a company and I pretty soon realized corporate world was a pyramid. You had to step on somebody to move up. Academics, in a sense, is an inverted pyramid. It's a pyramid where there are actually more professors than assistant professors. So you are on your own. You do good. You achieve what you want to do, and there's no stopping. So that inverted pyramid was a big motivation that I did not have to step on somebody to actually move up and think. And that's what I still enjoy about it, and that's what keeps me going. Thank, thank you, Anilji. Mahesh. Thank you. Uh, my grandson was three and a half or four years old, and I was trying to turn on the computer. Uh, the computer was new at that time, uh, and uh, in those times, the diskette has to be removed from the computer uh, before you can turn it on. And I was doing it again and again, and he looks at me, Baba, you're supposed to take the diskette out before you turn the computer on. So technology has been a little bit of a, uh, a difficulty, although when I came to MIT, PDP-11 had just come, and uh, I was introduced on PDP-11 and went to George Kameny at Dartmouth to uh, have a basics course, so to say. So that has been my struggle, uh, because I don't have patience to go through the uh, big, uh, I probably I will get a zero in that uh, test you gave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just exaggerating. All right. Um, the, I have many questions from the audience, and I'll take uh, one to Parth right now, uh, and then uh, we'll have um, two minutes to uh, give our concluding thoughts. So Parth, adaptive dynamic logic has been applied in neuroscience for the interaction between top-down and bottom-up processes. Has this model been applied to social group dynamics and interaction? That's a good question. So in economics, we're just starting now. So this is really cutting edge. So we're just starting to incorporate um, new, new uh, ideas and new disciplines from neuroscience. One of the things that's become really popular in economics lately has become uh, network economics, which is related to, to neural networks. Um, so I'm not sure if it's exactly uh, what the, the question was about, but network economics has become very, very popular in, in uh, economics recently as a way of explaining why behaviors happen as a result of learning from, from other people. Um, and this is something that's important also in uh, my own work as well as work in, in a lot of different disciplines that has a lot of um, applicability. Thank you, Parth. And then um, one final question for Prasadji. Uh, I'll, I'll make the timing even more constrained this time. So we'll test you out, 60 seconds. It will take more than a few passionate, charismatic activi activists to cause social change. How do you think we can create more leaders to ignite the fire in the belly so that we have more spokespeople and activists for the Hindu and human values we cherish? So this is going back to Sanatan Dharma. Um, I think the simple answer is um, the inherent beauty that there is uh, should be shown. And once people catch on to the beauty, then uh, the energies will unleash, and you will have an army of people, if only, I mean, you are able to inspire uh, by just showing the inherent beauty uh, in, um, in the sciences, in the teaching, um, uh, in the literature, and so on. So, so that's, that's my... Maheshji has a quick follow-up. Yes, uh, there are two things from diametrically opposite point of view. I'll bring it. Swanta Sukhai Kavi Raghunath Gatha. So anything we do with the idea that I will derive the greatest pleasure, then the others will derive great pleasure. And the other passage is from the Bible, as a matter of fact. By the works you will be known. If our work is so good and we are motivating to our all students, then by that work, others will follow. And as Hindus in America, if 
our work is so legendary, so to say, or exemplary, then we will go much farther here as well as there. Um, the concept of perseverance came in yesterday's sessions as well. We have exactly um, you know, four minutes remaining. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, move to uh, Professor Segel, and then we'll conclude our thoughts from, uh, from here. Professor Segel, do you have any concluding thoughts that you'd like, any takeaways that you want people to remember? Now again, uh, our philosophy teaches us uh, darkness to light. Education is everything. Everyone sitting in this room is here because of the education they received sometime in their life. There is half the world or whatever, some significant fraction of the world which has no access to education. And if you can do your little part, along with your friends, to bring lightness to their dark life, everyone will be in good shape. Thank you, Anilji. <laughs> Prasadji, any concluding thoughts? Um, yeah. Um, I just want to illustrate the point that I said about beauty. And uh, once you show the beauty, I mean, things will just catch on and people will catch fire and, uh, and do. Um, going back to my eighth grade, uh, my eighth grade math teacher told me that the area of a triangle is half times AB where A and B are the sides of, and he was talking about a right angle triangle, half AB. And then, uh, and then he asked all of us, do you know why? And we thought about it, no idea. <laughs> and then he said, simple. Um, what is the area of a rectangle whose sides are A and B? And we all said A times B, A, B. And then he drew one line um, across the diagonal and said, doesn't the rectangle have two triangles now? And we said, yes, so each triangle is half of the rectangle, half AB. And it's so simple, but once, I mean, once I saw that, you can, I mean, I can't tell you how empowered I felt. I felt that day that I suddenly instantly understood all the mathematics there is in the world. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and that's it. I mean, I had, I had an enthusiasm for mathematics. So for each person, I mean, that moment and that <coughs> fact and that unleashing of energy comes at different points, uh, but they just have to see that beauty or that which is holding them back. And the teacher, Chakshuran Militam Yena Tasmai Sri, uh, so, uh, so one who can open up um, uh, the eyes to that beauty, I mean, will be able to. So that's 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 so, the thing. Thank, th you. thank you for this aha moment, uh, Paralji. I think teaching is a very rewarding profession, and I think we should encourage more people to come into teaching, especially our younger people. I know we all have so much knowledge, we bring so many experiences, and the joy is to spread it over, to teach everybody. And um, it's so rewarding, like it's, a, I know people don't, young people do not come to teaching because uh, I guess the compensation is not as much as the other professions, but the rewards you get, it's uh, unbelievable, and uh, you cannot put a price to it. My best moments are when, children learn something and they have that spark in their eyes and that aha moment, like Prasadji said, once he understood what the area was and he was just like, oh my God, I understood everything, all mathematics. That, when you can create that in a child, he or she will become a lifelong learner. When my students come back and they say, that's my reward, when my students come back and they say, oh, chemistry was so easy in college because we already knew everything. It was so good. So that was my reward, and it's so uplifting. And I think we should all experience that. I want all of you to experience that. So encourage everybody. Everybody should, at some point of their life, should teach. I think that's Thank you, Parth. Parth, final comments. Yeah, so I definitely agree with everything that was said. Um, I think teaching is one of the most rewarding experiences for, for all of us. Um, I know that when students email me back at the end of a term or if they come, after, come to me after class and they say, this was really helpful, I didn't understand what was said during lecture, but when you explained it to me, I get it now. That's one of the most rewarding experiences. 
um, because ultimately, as, as educators and as academics, we're really interested in sharing our ideas with other people, getting them inspired to do their own work uh, in, in whatever field they want to. Um, and this is really how you create human uh, capital, human growth in the society, how you, um, like as Spiral G say, how you communicate civilization into the society. So I know that Indian parents always want their kids to be doctors, engineers, and lawyers, but really, really, really do consider promoting your child to be an educator if that's what they want to do. Um, it's something that has been revered within our tradition, and I think it's sometimes a little bit disappointing that we always shunt our children into the medical field. Not that there's anything wrong with the medical field or the engineering field or the legal field, but also consider your child as an educator. Thank you. Um, we've gotten many words of wisdom from our panel. I'd like to thank uh, Jay Bansalji and all the organizers for Threads. Uh, we'd like to conclude this session here. Um, thank you, everybody, for your insightful questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. And I would like to uh, thank all my panelists here. Maheshji has one final word that he'd like to make. For last 53 years, I have concluded all my classes at the university or wherever I'm teaching or a conference with the last a passage. So I want to share that in one, my, in my, one my minute. Energy. And everybody knows this one, so it's nothing new. And I always tell, because I train teachers, and one of the complaints they have is that there's no respect for teachers. So I share that in every course. Guru Govind Dono Khade Kake Lagu Pai Balihari Guru Apne Govind Dio Batai. If we do that, and I say it in the last, because I want to make sure that they at least see something in me as a teacher to carry on. So if you want to be in teaching profession, in Vivek Chumaranimani, they have the characteristics of a teacher, and that has to be portrayed. Thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you, and with that, I'd like to conclude this uh, discussion. Asatoma sadgamaya tamasoma jyotirgamaya mrityorma amritangamaya.